Greetings from Boston, Massachusetts in the US. Kim Eng and I will be talking to you today about a project that we've been running. Uh, we're calling this talk Customer First Focus and how we blended design thinking with lean thinking in solving an important business problem. We'll also share an actual case study, although the case study isn't completed yet, uh, it's actually in flight but we will share what we've done so far uh, and go deep in some areas as much as we're able because we've already gone to the, those points. So our objectives today with you are to understand the human-centered design thinking method for drawing out our user needs and key insights within the context of the design challenge that we're tackling and learn how a blended approach using design thinking and lean thinking provides a better design for all. So we decided to combine two schools of thought, lean or lean 3P design to be specific, as well as design thinking. We find those methodologies complementary, and this was to tackle a real business problem at Lynn Community Health Center. It's a community health center located in Massachusetts in the United States. We were leveraging both methodologies to come up with a different but comprehensive approach for our design challenge. And I'll tell you what that is in a moment. Design thinking is a set of tools and methods which support our effort to understand the way people, which includes patients, staff, and providers, the, the way the people do things and why they do them, what their physical and emotional needs are, and how they think about the world and what is meaningful to them. And all of that was lived through actionable activities that Kim and I designed to help our design team learn more deeply about our customer, the patient. We felt that this empathetic work led by design thinking was a natural partner for lean thinking, which always thinks about customer first. So here's our presenting problem. Let's hear from the CEO of Lynn Community Health Center who will describe the problem we're facing. But uh, it turns out that most health, healthcare workers have sort of come to terms with the idea that they work for a system that doesn't always work well, right? We've sort of adapted to a payment system that doesn't work well, a social system that doesn't really support our patients well and a variety of different things or institutions that don't seem to respond to what frontline staff and workers want. As you know, um, I've been talking about this change, this fundamental change that's coming to us on January 1st, 2023. So that's now in 13 months. Um, and uh, what's really happening there is that on January 1st, all our patients who have Mass Health, which is uh, Medicaid in Massachusetts, and Medicaid is the insurance that uh, you get uh, that's government funded and it's generally income based. But as well as our Medicare patients, which is the insurance that people get when they're over 65 or when they're disabled, as well as our Blue Cross Blue Shield patients will all be moving to a value based payment. And this is a really deep, deep change. Um, because many of the things that we have today are set up because of the way we're paid. The reason we have these visits is because of the way we're paid. Um, and so um, the fact that we're moving to a different payment system means that actually uh, there's opportunity for us to really focus on our patients' needs and our patients' desire. And when I mentioned a true respect for patients' dignity, that is really what I feel is really at the core of our mission, meaning that we want to serve our patients. We want to help them achieve their goals in life through health, uh, but we want to make it in a convenient way. We want to make it in a way that they feel is respectful with a minimum of disruption. And so we have now, we've had about a year and a half uh, to really seriously prepare. Um, and uh, the phase that we're in right now is that we have a number of your colleagues that have been meeting. They've been met, they've met for six sessions so far and they have uh, five more. Um, and the goal is really to imagine what would an ideal care model look like? What would it entail? Um, and so really what, what I, we're asking them to do is to put aside what we have now 
to think about and in as concrete ways as possible what they would want the model to look like in the future so that we can start seeing how far we are from where we are now for where we need to be in the future. Now I'm going to turn over to Kim to talk about our current state. So you just heard from our CEO as he talked about our presenting problem. And if we take a closer look at current state and what it looks like in the United States today, if you take a look at each primary care doctor that works in the United States, a study was done that typically the work needed to care for our patients is about 21 hours per day. So we know this obviously is not happening, but if you look at what's required by our regulatory agencies and the clinical work demanded by our patients, it's really overwhelming. So if we look at the content of the physician work on a daily basis, the way that the day is designed is really visit-based. And so physicians are busy moving from room to room seeing patients. Meanwhile, messages from patients are piling up throughout the day and usually aren't answered until the end of the day. And as we know, this means that patients are waiting. And so we know that if we are not caring for our caregivers and making their work doable and intentionally designing their work, patients are waiting and it affects patients. So if we take a look at a national perspective and looking at the United States, we really are seeing this rise in primary care doctor burnout. And so much so that it's about 50% for physicians. So burnout really is that definition is an experience of physical, emotional, or mental exhaustion caused by long-term involvement in situations that are just emotionally draining. And so we are seeing this across the United States. Tammy talked about at the same time, our context is changing. So we have to change. And so as we think about the problem or the challenge that we are facing, our big challenge is how might we design a model of care to better serve our patients and attract new patients. So we formed a design team made up of people all over the health center with diverse and valuable perspectives. And it was helpful to include these roles as we all contribute to care in very different ways for our patients. So why design thinking as an organization that has embraced lean thinking? Why introduce yet another methodology? So why design thinking? Lean gives us a customer first focus, but no methodology for unpacking the patient's needs. So we created a new approach by blending the strengths of lean and design thinking. Now, design thinking is a human-centered approach. Patients are patients only a certain percentage of their time, but they're humans the entire time. And so we thought about our customer, the patient, in a much broader sense, their context, how they live, what they hoped for, their physical and emotional needs, as I said earlier. So what were we trying to do? We were trying to approach this with the patient's needs at the center and using empathetic approaches and actions to understand that through our research. Our goal was to create and deliver next level customer value. So our approach was to design for the whole, all of the customer's needs, not just that single interaction in a visit with us and not looking at the individual functions for the worker's efficiency, which is how many of us design our interactions. Our current facilities force and enhance the siloed mentality that our patients and staff suffer through. So we believe we could use design to create the best patient and staff experience. So again, design for the whole. So we use three lenses. This is from uh, the design thinking methodology and start with a customer need, what is called desirability. And that's where you begin your focus as you start your research on what do our customers want and desire. Only then do we focus on, is it feasible technically and organizationally, and is it financially viable? The intersection of those three is what we call human-centered design through empathy. So here is the design thinking innovation approach. You can see we start with concrete where we first design the challenge. What are we tackling as our design problem? And the empathetic research we start helps us to observe people in their environment 
And that includes conversations we have, interviews, if you wish, but really conversations. And from those, we start to form insights. Some of the latent needs that might not be obvious at first glance start to float to the top. So the concrete is narrow and focused, but after that, we start to diverge and go into abstract phases where we explore possibilities and understand what the potential opportunities are based on those insights we glean from those user observations and interviews. So to go into a little bit more about the approach and methodology, we went both wide and deep, which meant we went to the full range of stakeholders, both you could call the early adopters and the resistors. And that's to not design for the average consumer, which could be 33% of the whole. But if we approach the full range, the breadth and depth of our customers to study, we knew we would cover and solve for more of our customers. What we wanted to do was understand all the different perspectives of those that serve our customers. And so this was much more collaborative and holistic an approach, and we didn't design functional silos. Again, we were designing for the entire user experience and understanding all of those touch points, regardless of how we were organized. Just what were those latent and explicit needs through those interviews, conversations, to encourage storytelling from the people we were talking to, whether they were staff providers or patients, to reveal more than the obvious. This is a learning process we've been following. We were creating choices and options as we diverge and go broad. We were exploring all these problem edges and no set solutions. So we were really about generating all these new ideas and I think what we were learning, so if you narrow too soon, you won't design something that works for most people. Converging is when we start to make choices and we are not at converging quite yet. And we're staying in blue sky before we come down to earth. And that's how we describe this. So we saw this work like a little bit like anthropology. And so like anthropologists, we went to study people in the field. We did observations. We collect the data by having conversations and interviews to uncover and deeply understand patterns of behavior and real needs. Our go sees which is of course a core lean method, helped us observe behaviors in the field and provided us the context of both the organization as it was now and the processes and how did the people behave and interact in those contexts. And from there, we started to generate lots of ideas and insights and said, let's start to test and do prototypes so that we could understand what does that look like? What does that mean? How will we interact with these? And started to go deeper and deeper into the understanding of what our customers need. Our design challenge is how might we design a model of care at Lynn Community Health Center to better serve our patients and attract new patients. So this is a really complex problem and we are breaking things down to better understand the needs of our patients, our staff and our providers. Alice just spoke about the interview process that we went through and that interview process generated all of this great information. We took this collection of information and gathered from our observations and interviews and conversations, and we created a poster for each, and we recorded those in what we call my stories. The interview questions didn't specifically ask, what do you care about? But the interviewer's job was to get at the underlying needs. So for staff and providers, we wanted to learn what gets in the way of their work and learn about their challenges, what they care about, and what surprised us as we listened. We also interviewed and observed our patients and heard them tell stories in their own words, which helped us better understand what they care deeply about, understanding our patient preferences and understanding how they see their care. Once we had all of the stories documented, it became clear that we had recurring and common themes. Care how I want it. That refers to the patient and how they want to receive care. 
joy at work is all about what makes staff happy at work and the things that contribute to staff enjoying the work they do. GPS, navigating our health center. This theme is for employees or patients and is about getting staff and patients the right resources and knowledge at the right time. System harmony is about how the different components of our system work together for the patient and our team members. And team playbook is centered around how our teams operate, our processes, standards, and inner team communication and collaboration. And finally, Know Me is about how we share and communicate information about our patients so that the patient feels that we know them regardless of who's caring for them that day. So in many ways, this process was a turning point for the team through the design challenge. It really built this genuine empathy for our patients, our staff, and our providers and what they go through on a daily basis. This allowed the team to design much more empathetically and what we did with these stories was we started to take these insights that we had gleaned from our user research and translate them into more actionable steps. The culmination of what we learned in our anthropologic study was these six themes. And if we designed for these six themes, what an opportunity. But how did we get started? So as you can imagine, uh, not everyone has a work day that is filled with innovating. And so first we had to learn how to think way differently about our problem. This is not something we do on a regular basis, just think really differently. So because we all function in a really narrow converging way, we're focused on what are we doing now? And if we're lucky, what are we doing tomorrow? We don't have time, space, or materials and energy to open that all up. So we started looking and asking how do other innovators innovate? So we looked at companies like Chipotle, Nike, the MIT Media Lab, and even got inspirations from nature. And what we learned was that each of these innovators understood that they were leading. There was no roadmap, no benchmark, no cut and paste thinking from others. They also understood their customers really deeply uh, and gleaned valuable insights from their customers. So as we moved into conceptual design, we were really moving into the abstraction phase. We used our customer insights and we were using those to start to move into and gain big ideas. To get people ready for this exercise, we actually started with this paperclip. So we gave everyone a paperclip and asked them to take five minutes to think about all the different ways you could use a paperclip and have them write those down on post-its and share what, what they thought were most interesting and really try to get people to stretch their thinking and at least get to seven different ways you could use a paper clip. But many people actually went way beyond that. And you can see here all the different ideas that came out, um, anywhere from um, holding paper, which was simple. And so like after you did three or four, they were really basic ideas. But after that, it took a, a lot to stretch yourself. So we went through multiple rounds of conceptual design to really get our team to stretch their thinking. And throughout the rounds, we were actually capturing all of the big ideas that they were creating so that we could then, as we move into the next phase, make those more concrete. So from these conceptual designs, we pulled out what we call big ideas from each round. There's four rounds, you can see four colors of post-its. And these things would include not having the patient move and having services come to the patient or that the rockets would orbit around the patient, the sun, and come in and land as needed. So what we were doing with these big ideas was pulling the principal thoughts, the design elements that made the most sense that we could move forward as we started to build levels of design. This exercise is very similar to thinking about the ideal state and future state, but it's more informed and more structured, and it brings in all of our customer user research that we had done in the early stages and brings in much more of the customer voice. We're using creative thinking to um, develop these drawings actually has a real purpose. That gathering these big ideas really is the foundation that will bring us into the next phase around functional design and we will carry these big ideas forward. You know, even though it's conceptual design, there were design parameters. Mm -hmm. How might we incorporate the guiding principles, the 10 principles 
the seven flows of health care. This was much more difficult than make a drawing of these functions. And so we started to translate and move into our prototyping or functional design, which was really about building to test and testing to learn. And so the goal was, how do we take all the big ideas that we came up with in our conceptual and get more concrete with them? That's right. And it's an iterative process, as you can see, uh, when we start prototyping or creating functional designs. And the idea is to generate a series of artifacts that helps you answer questions that you have around the design challenge or the problem that we're trying to solve. And it moves us closer to the final solution that is most right for your situation. This was actually surprisingly very challenging for our team. Um, they were so used to being in the conceptual world that it was actually hard to get concrete. So we've had one full day of functional design and let's tell you about where we are now. One of our teachers is IDEO, which is a design firm and they call design a contact sport and I couldn't agree more as we go through this process. That's definitely the case just ended a week and a half ago, and we had a major U.S. holiday in between, so we're going to pick it up again next week to finish and move into the next phase of our design process. But here you can hear Kiami, our CEO, talk about our process and where we are. Well, hopefully you've gotten a glimpse of the work that we're doing. Uh, in a way, if you think of this as a journey, most people use a map to be able to decide where they're going. In our case, we don't know where we're going yet. And so one of the goals of this team is to design, a to define our destination. So that's really what's happening now. And then the next phase, uh, when they are done, it will be even involved even more people. And that is how do we get to where we want to go? So what I'd love to do now is let you hear from members of our design team. One thing that really surprised me about the work we've been doing um, in these workshop is how much we don't know or understand about each other's roles. And I think that one of the things that opened up an opportunity to understand each other was going to Gemba um, to kind of see how everyone's roles and their interactions with patients um, change the way that we, we care for them and how we can improve those methods to create an even better system of care. Uh, by continuing to stay in these abstract conceptual designs for so long, we were really able to keep our central mission to the patient in focus throughout this process. So we're learning different techniques and one of the techniques that we've been learning about is called seven ways. And with seven ways, um, we're presented with like one problem and you have to come up um, with seven different ideas or ways that you would approach that problem. Um, and it's a really interesting exercise because the first couple of ideas that you think about are pretty easy. They just come to you as like the most obvious um, ideas. But what's good about the seven ways is that you continue coming up with ideas until you reach seven, which really pushes you beyond, uh, pushes your thinking beyond what you would normally even be able to come up with. So that was really interesting. I think that what happens on a daily basis is we have this kind of convergent way of thinking. We're really narrow. Um, we think about what do we need to do today? What do we need to get done tomorrow? We don't really have the time or the energy or the space or the resources to think outside of that. And it's weird and it's uncomfortable, but it's a really important skill to have. The work that we do here is challenging and sometimes it's very difficult to kind of see what we're doing and how it really impacts others. To a point where I didn't even know how much we really impact them. Um, especially since, you know, a lot of times we just do things that are just part of our roles and we're like, you know, it, that's what I'm supposed to do, just get it done. Um, but they actually see these little things that we see invisible and it really means a lot to them. So where we're at in the process now is we've distilled all these ideas that we've come up with in the last couple of weeks into really big ideas and um, the things that we're really passionate about as a group. We're doing this on our end, but we also need everybody's feedback from the whole health center to figure out what this is going to look like in the future. So what we have done in this group is we have put a lot of ideas together as a group and ideas in different concepts, different models, and nothing here was a solution. Everything started off as how we um, portrayed something, how we thought of them, and ideas just start popping out in different ways. Um, that even surprised us as a group. 
um, and we get to hear different perspectives. We're more of stepping back from the actual picture itself and just realizing that there's more than just quick to find a solution and just think of the rationale. As we've been working on the conceptual design, I can literally feel my brain stretching. I'm using it in ways that I don't usually use it, and it feels good. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Kim couldn't stay for the Q&A, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Now I know seven is Denise's favorite number. It's mine too. <laughs> and I see in the chat that our CEO, Kiami Mahania is saying, I can attest that the members of this team feel that this work has been transformational for how they look at the world how they think of their own agency. We have seen personal transformation in this team after um, five meetings. It's, it's been really wonderful work. Do we have any questions? Well, we're continuing this work in the next week or so. Um, as you heard Cami say, we have about six more sessions left, and I promise to tell you how this story ends. How's that? Perfect. <laughs> All right. And I'm happy to end early. It's been a long day. <laughs> All right, then. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Alice. All right.